Section 2 of Pascendi Dominici Gregis on the Errors of the Modernists by Pope St. Pius X. Translated by Thomas E. Judge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Encyclical, Part 2 The Church A wider field for comment is opened when you come to treat of the vagaries devised by the modernist school concerning the church you must start with the supposition that the church has its birth in a double need the need of the individual believer especially if he has had some original and special experience to communicate his faith to others and the need of the mass when the faith has become common to many to form itself into a society and to guard increase and propagate the common good what then is the church it is the product of the collective conscience that is to say of the society of individual consciences which by virtue of the principle of vital permanence all depend on one first believer who for catholics is christ now every society needs a directing authority to guide its members towards the common end to conserve prudently the elements of cohesion which in a religious society are doctrine and worship hence the triple authority in the catholic church disciplinary dogmatic liturgical the nature of this authority is to be gathered from its origin and its rights and duties from its nature in past times it was a common error that authority came to the church from without that is to say directly from god and then it was rightly held to be autocratic but this conception has now grown obsolete for in the same way as the church is a vital emanation of the collectivity of consciences so too authority emanates vitally from the church itself authority therefore like the church has its origin in the religious conscience and that being so is subject to it should it disown this dependence it becomes a tyranny for we are living in an age when the sense of liberty has reached its fullest development and when the public conscience has in the civil order introduced popular government now there are not two consciences in man any more than there are two lives it is for the ecclesiastical authority therefore to shape itself to democratic forms unless it wishes to provoke and foment an intestine conflict in the consciences of mankind the penalty of refusal is disaster for it is madness to think that the sentiment of liberty as it is now spread abroad can surrender were it forcibly confined and held in bonds terrible would be its outburst sweeping away at once both church and religion such is the situation for the modernists and their one great anxiety is in consequence to find a way of conciliation between the authority of the church and the liberty of believers the relations between church and state but it is not with its own members alone that the church must come to an amicable arrangement besides its relations with those within it it has others outside the church does not occupy the world all by itself there are other societies in the world with which it must necessarily have contact and relations the rights and duties of the church towards civil societies must therefore be determined and determined of course by its own nature as the modernists have already described it the rules to be applied in this matter are those which have been laid down for science and faith though in the latter case the question is one of objects while here we have one of ends in the same way then as faith and science are strangers to each other by reason of the diversity of their objects church and state are strangers by reason of the diversity of their ends that of the church being spiritual while that of the state is temporal formerly it was possible to subordinate the temporal to the spiritual and to speak of some questions as mixed allowing to the church the position of queen and mistress in all such because the church was then regarded 
as having been instituted immediately by God as the author of the supernatural order. But this doctrine is today repudiated, alike by philosophers and historians. The state must, therefore, be separated from the church and the Catholic from the citizen. Every Catholic, from the fact that he is also a citizen, has the right and the duty to work for the common good in the way he thinks best, without troubling himself about the authority of the church, without paying any heed to its wishes, its counsels, its orders, nay, even in spite of its reprimands. To trace out and prescribe for the citizen any line of conduct, on any pretext whatsoever, is to be guilty of an abuse of ecclesiastical authority, against which one is bound to act with all one's might. The principles from which these doctrines spring have been solemnly condemned by our predecessor Pius VI in his constitution Auctorum Fidei. The Magisterium of the Church But it is not enough for the modernist school that the state should be separated from the church. For, as faith is to be subordinated to science, as far as phenomenal elements are concerned, so, too, in temporal matters, the church must be subject to the state. They do not say this openly, as yet, but they are logically committed to it. For, given the principle that, in temporal matters, the state possesses absolute mastery, it will follow that, when the believer, not fully satisfied with his merely internal acts of religion, proceeds to external acts, such, for instance, as the administration or reception of the sacraments, these will fall under the control of the state. What will then become of ecclesiastical authority, which can only be exercised by external acts? Obviously, it will be completely under the dominion of the state. It is this inevitable consequence which impels many among liberal Protestants to reject all external worship, nay, all external religious community, and makes them advocate what they call individual religion. If the modernists have not yet reached this point, they do ask the Church, in the meanwhile, to be good enough to follow spontaneously where they lead her, and adapt herself to the civil forms in vogue. Such are their ideas about disciplinary authority. But far more advanced, and far more pernicious, are their teachings on doctrinal and dogmatic authority. This is their conception of the magisterium of the Church. No religious society, they say, can be a real unit unless the religious conscience of its members be one, and one also the formula which they adopt. But this double unity requires a kind of common mind, whose office is to find and determine the formula that corresponds best with the common conscience, and it must have, moreover, an authority sufficient to enable it to impose upon the community the formula which has been decided upon. From the combination, and, as it were, fusion of the common mind which draws up the formula, and the authority which imposes it, arises, according to the modernists, the notion of the ecclesiastical magisterium. And as this magisterium springs, in its last analysis, from the individual consciences, and possesses its mandate for their benefit, it follows that the ecclesiastical magisterium must be subordinate to them, and should, therefore, take democratic forms. To prevent individual consciences from revealing freely and openly the impulses they feel, to hinder criticism from imperiling dogmas towards their necessary evolutions, this is not a legitimate use, but an abuse of a power given for the public utility. So, too, a due method and measure must be observed in the exercise of authority. To condemn and proscribe a work, without the knowledge of the author, without hearing his explanations, without discussion, assuredly savours of tyranny. And thus, here again, a mean must be found to save the full rights of authority, on the one hand, and of liberty, on the other. In the meanwhile, the proper course for the Catholic will be to proclaim publicly his profound respect for authority, and continue to follow his own bent. Their general directions for the Church may be put in this way. 
since the end of the church is entirely spiritual the religious authority should strip itself of all that external pomp which adorns it in the eyes of the public and here they forget that while religion is essentially for the mind it is not exclusively for the mind and that the honour paid to authority is reflected back on jesus christ who instituted it the evolution of doctrine to finish with this whole question of faith and its shoots it remains to be seen venerable brethren what the modernists have to say about their development first of all they lay down the general principle that in a living religion everything is subject to change and must in fact change and in this way they pass to what may be said to be among the chief of their doctrines that of evolution to the worship of evolution everything is subject dogma church worship the books we revere as sacred even faith itself and the penalty of disobedience is death the enunciation of this principle will not astonish anybody who bears in mind what the modernists have had to say about each of these subjects having laid down this law of evolution the modernists themselves teach us how it works out and first with regard to faith the primitive form of faith they tell us was rudimentary and common to all men alike for it had its origin in human nature and human life vital evolution brought with it progress not by the accretion of new and purely adventitious forms from without but by an increasing penetration of the religious sentiment in the consciousness this progress was of two kinds negative by the elimination of all foreign elements such for example as the sentiment of family or nationality and positive by that intellectual and moral refining of man by means of which the idea of the divine was enlarged and enlightened while the religious sentiment became more elevated and more intense for the progress of faith no other causes are to be assigned than those which are adduced to explain its origin but to them must be added those religious geniuses whom we call prophets and of whom christ was the greatest both because in their lives and their words there was something mysterious which faith attributed to the divinity and because it fell to their lot to have new and original experiences fully in harmony with the needs of their time the progress of dogma is due chiefly to the obstacles which faith has to surmount to the enemies it has to vanquish to the contradictions it has to repel add to this a perpetual striving to penetrate ever more profoundly its own mysteries thus to omit other examples as it happened in the case of christ in him that divine something which faith admitted in him expanded in such a way that he was at last held to be god the chief stimulus of evolution in the domain of worship consists in the need of adapting itself to the uses and customs of peoples as well as the need of availing itself of the value which certain acts have acquired by long usage finally evolution in the church itself is fed by the need of accommodating itself to historical conditions and of harmonizing itself with existing forms of society such is religious evolution in detail and here before proceeding further we would have you note well this whole theory of necessities and needs for it is at the root of the entire system of the modernists and it is upon it that they will erect that famous method of theirs called the historical still continuing the consideration of the evolution of doctrine it is to be noted that evolution is due no doubt to those stimulants styled needs but if left to their action alone it would run a great risk of bursting the bounds of tradition and thus turned aside from its primitive vital principle would lead to ruin instead of progress hence studying more closely the ideas of the modernists evolution is described as resulting from the conflict of two forces one of them tending towards progress the other towards conservatism the conserving force in the church is tradition 
and tradition is represented by religious authority, and this both by right and in fact. For by right it is in the very nature of authority to protect tradition, and in fact, for authority, raised as it is above the contingencies of life, feels hardly, or not at all, the spurs of progress. The progressive force, on the contrary, which responds to the inner needs, lies in the individual consciences and ferments there, especially in such of them as are in most intimate contact with life. Note here, venerable brethren, the appearance already of that most pernicious doctrine which would make of the laity a factor of progress in the church. Now it is by a species of compromise between the forces of conservatism and of progress, that is to say, between authority and individual consciences, that changes and advances take place. The individual consciences of some of them act on the collective conscience, which brings pressure to bear on the depositaries of authority, until the latter consent to a compromise, and, the pact being made, authority sees to its maintenance. With all this in mind, one understands how it is that the modernists express astonishment when they are reprimanded or punished. What is imputed to them as a fault, they regard as a sacred duty. The needs of consciences no one knows better than they, since they are in closer touch with them than even the ecclesiastical authority. Having a voice and a pen, they use both publicly, for this is their duty. Let authority rebuke them as much as it pleases, they have their own conscience on their side, and an intimate experience which tells them with certainty that what they deserve is not blame, but praise. Then they reflect that, after all, there is no progress without a battle, and no battle without its victim, and victims they are willing to be, like the prophets and Christ himself. They have no bitterness in their hearts against the authority which uses them roughly, for, after all, it is only doing its duty as authority. Their sole grief is that it remains deaf to their warnings, because delay multiplies the obstacles which impede the progress of souls. But the hour will most surely come when there will be no further chance for tergiversation. For if the laws of evolution may be checked for a while, they cannot be ultimately destroyed. And so they go their way, reprimands and condemnations notwithstanding, masking an incredible audacity under a mock semblance of humility. While they make a show of bowing their heads, their hands and minds are more intent than ever on carrying out their purposes. And this policy they follow willingly and wittingly, both because it is a part of their system that authority is to be stimulated but not dethroned, and because it is necessary for them to remain within the ranks of the church in order that they may, gradually, transform the collective conscience, thus unconsciously avowing that the common conscience is not with them, and that they have no right to claim to be its interpreters. Thus then, venerable brethren, for the modernists, both as authors and propagandists, there is to be nothing stable, nothing immutable in the church. Nor indeed are they without precursors in their doctrines, for it was of these that our predecessor, Pius the Ninth, wrote, These enemies of divine revelation extolled human progress to the skies, and, with rash and sacrilegious daring, would have it introduced into the Catholic religion, as if this religion were not the work of God, but of man, or some kind of philosophical discovery susceptible of perfection by human efforts. On the subject of revelation, and dogma in particular, the doctrine of the modernists offers nothing new. We find it condemned in the syllabus of Pius the Ninth, where it is enunciated in these terms. Divine revelation is imperfect, and therefore subject to continual and indefinite progress, corresponding with the progress of human reason. And condemned still more solemnly in the Vatican Council. The doctrine of the faith, which God has revealed, has not been proposed to human intelligences to be perfected by them as if it were a philosophical system, but as a divine deposit entrusted to the spouse of Christ 
to be faithfully guarded and infallibly interpreted. Hence the sense, too, of the sacred dogmas is that which our Holy Mother, the Church, has once declared, nor is this sense ever to be abandoned on plea or pretext of a more profound comprehension of the truth. Nor is the development of our knowledge, even concerning the faith, impeded by this pronouncement. On the contrary, it is aided and promoted. For the same counsel continues, Let intelligence and science and wisdom, therefore, increase and progress abundantly and vigorously in individuals, and in the mass, in the believer, and in the whole church, throughout the ages and the centuries, but only in its own kind, that is, according to the same dogma, the same sense, the same acceptation. The Modernist as Historian and Critic After having studied the Modernist as philosopher, believer and theologian, it now remains for us to consider him as historian, critic, apologist, reformer. Some modernists, devoted to historical studies, seem to be greatly afraid of being taken for philosophers. About philosophy, they tell you, they know nothing whatever, and in this they display remarkable astuteness, for they are particularly anxious not to be suspected of being prejudiced in favour of philosophical theories, which would lay them open to the charge of not being objective, to use the word in vogue. And yet the truth is that their history and their criticism are saturated with their philosophy, and that their historico-critical conclusions are the natural fruit of their philosophical principles. This will be patent to anybody who reflects. Their first three laws are contained in those three principles of their philosophy already dealt with, the principle of agnosticism, the principle of the transfiguration of things by faith, and the principle which we have called of disfiguration. Let us see what consequences flow from each of them. Agnosticism tells us that history, like every other science, deals entirely with phenomena, and the consequence is that God, and every intervention of God in human affairs, is to be relegated to the domain of faith as belonging to it alone. In things where a double element, the divine and the human, mingles, in Christ, for example, or in the church, or the sacraments, or the many other objects of the same kind, a division must be made, and the human element assigned to history, while the divine will go to faith. Hence we have that distinction, so current among the modernists, between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith, between the church of history and the church of faith, between the sacraments of history and the sacraments of faith, and so on. Next we find that the human element itself, which the historian has to work on, as it appears in the documents, has been by faith transfigured, that is to say, raised above its historical conditions. It becomes necessary, therefore, to eliminate also the accretions which faith has added, to assign them to faith itself and to the history of faith. Thus, when treating of Christ, the historian must set aside all that surpasses man in his natural condition, either according to the psychological conception of him, or according to the place and period of his existence. Finally, by virtue of the third principle, even those things which are not outside the sphere of history, they pass through the crucible, excluding from history and relegation to faith everything which, in their judgment, is not in harmony with what they call the logic of facts, and in character with the persons of whom they are predicated. Thus they will not allow that Christ ever uttered those things which do not seem to be within the capacity of the multitudes that listened to him. Hence they delete from his real history, and transfer to faith all the allegories found in his discourses. Do you inquire as to the criterion they adopt to enable them to make these divisions? The reply is that they argue from the character of the man, from his condition of life, from his education, from the circumstances under which the facts took place. In short, from criteria which, if one considers them well, are purely subjective. 
Their method is to put themselves into the position and person of Christ, and then to attribute to him what they would have done under like circumstances. In this way, absolutely a priori, and acting on philosophical principles, which they admit they hold, but which they affect to ignore, they proclaim that Christ, according to what they call his real history, was not God, and never did anything divine, and that as man he did and said only what they, judging from the time in which he lived, can admit him to have said or done. Criticism and its Principles And as history receives its conclusions, ready-made, from philosophy, so too criticism takes its own from history. The critic, on the data furnished him by the historian, makes two parts of all his documents. Those that remain after the triple elimination above described go to form the real history. The rest is attributed to the history of the faith, or, as it is styled, to internal history. For the modernists distinguish very carefully between these two kinds of history, and it is to be noted that they oppose the history of the faith to real history precisely as real. Thus we have a double Christ, a real Christ, and a Christ, the one of faith, who never really existed, a Christ who has lived at a given time and in a given place, and a Christ who has never lived outside the pious meditations of the believer, the Christ, for instance, whom we find in the Gospel of St. John, which is pure speculation from beginning to end. But the dominion of philosophy over history does not end here. Given that division, of which we have spoken, of the documents into two parts, the philosopher steps in again with his principle of vital imminence, and shows how everything in the history of the Church is to be explained by vital emanation. And since the cause, or condition, of every vital emanation whatsoever is to be found in some need, it follows that no fact can antedate the need which produced it. Historically, the fact must be posterior to the need. See how the historian works on this principle. He goes over his documents again, whether they be found in the sacred books or elsewhere, draws up from them his list of the successive needs of the church, whether relating to dogma or liturgy or other matters, and then he hands his list over to the critic. The critic takes in hand the documents dealing with the history of faith and distributes them, period by period, so that they correspond exactly with the list of needs, always